<laughs> so yeah, my, my name is Marcus Burton. I know all of you, but for anyone watching, uh, I started Ruckus about five months ago and was uh, independent before that. Uh, I worked at CWMP with Tom Carpenter, one of the delegates. I was a field day delegate for the first two wireless field days and uh, you know, have been here. It was kind of cool to be at CWMP and be able to just kind of sit back and look at the industry from afar and you know, just kind of look at technologies and trends and see who's doing what and uh, you know, sort of be able to pick you know, in some ways where would I want to go and prioritize vendors and so you know, Ruckus was, was that for me. So uh, to spare you the rest of the sales pitch, um, this is a new building for us. Uh, we just moved in on Friday, so normally, uh, if you would come in here, we'd have all sorts of offensive decorations and, you know, things that Jennifer or someone else, <laughs> you know, <laughs> might, might not like so much. But, uh, so yeah, so that's why it's kind of a, a bare room. So, you know, if you're assessing our building, that's why it's somewhat plain. So, um, we have uh, some unique technology at Ruckus, and we're going to talk about those things, and I think everyone has heard, you know, the one primary thing that we talk about a lot, you know, the antenna. But we have, you know, the antenna is sort of like our exclamation point to everything else that we do. And so we want to talk about those things. And uh, so we've got a lot of smart people here. Um, and they're going to be, you know, we've got four different presenters. Uh, but before we get to the smart people. Thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't forget, you got to go over there. Do I? You got, you, oh, this stuff. All right. Uh, thanks, Marcus. You're still on probation, so. <laughs> uh, so I'm GT Hill. I've been at Ruckus uh, almost three years now, which has uh, been great. It's been a great ride. I was employee 179, I think. We're almost to 600 today. We have this fancy new building that should last us at least uh, 18 months before we overfill it. Uh, what I wanted to start with, a couple things. I want you to introduce yourself to us quickly. Unfortunately, uh, two hours seems to be kind of tight for us. Stephen, we may need to pay for more next time. Yeah. You okay with that? <laughs> yeah, I'm okay with that. Uh, so, so we want to do some uh, quick intros, but uh, quick run through the agenda. We're going to have Steve Martin, VP, Senior VP of Engineering in here. Uh, really smart guy, great guy. And our, our theme for the today is beyond the reference design. So what do we do differently when we make an access point? What do we do differently on the hardware side and the software side? And surprisingly, it's, it's, uh, it's probably 50-50. It's a lot of software that it takes to make things really good. But in that spirit, I wanted to, to kind of show you guys something that shows you how we can make hardware uh, differently and, and how we do things differently. So we have a, a gift for you that Marcus is going to pass out. Hand, hold, hold it up so people can oh, see it. That is awesome. <laughs> so these are uh, name tags. It says my name on it. <laughs> <laughs> so this, uh, hold it, hold it, I'm coming by. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's awesome. So this is actually coming out of a, an antenna that's still actually prototyped. It's actually in a product that we don't actually sell on the open market yet. This is called the Thunderbolt 2 antenna. We have code names for all of them. So what you have is a vertical stanchion off of, uh, off of these. And we have some extras. So when you have these printed in mass, it's not any more expensive. So you have some extra blanks if you want to use them for anything. But anyway, this is a, it's out of a real antenna. It's actually, if you energize you, it would actually uh, be real and everything. So this, this is going to go in my office's my name plate now. Awesome. Yeah, we appreciate that. <laughs> so I wanted to start by just going around the room. If you could take you know, 20, 30 seconds to tell us about yourself. and Because uh, I don't know all of you. I uh, am happy to meet all of you, though. So we're going to start with Mr. Parsons. Hi, right. Mr. Parsons. <laughs> yeah, I have yeah. the nameplate and everything. Uh, I can be here. Just do, I do Wi-Fi. Great. Uh, my name is Jennifer Huber. I've been in wireless for about nine or ten years now, and I belong to most everything. Great. I'm Sam Clements, um, and I, I guess to say we're on the wireless is probably not. Uh, I work in the partner space. Um, Dan Sabalski, I come from a security bar, but I focus mainly in, in wireless security. Excellent. John Renewson, I run uh, WifiGeeks.org. Uh, I work for a large uh, healthcare organization, and uh, I do wireless. You work for a large healthcare organization? Excellent. And what are your Twitter handles? Uh, 
Keith Parsons. Simply Wi-Fi. Simply Wi-Fi. Yes, Okay, excellent. You're next, sir. I'm Tom Carpenter, CWNP, uh, Twitter, Carpenter Tom. And uh, I can't about what this is. I know why everybody says GT is so amazing. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, supposed be, it's supposed to be him saying it. Yeah. <laughs> it's the power. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Really? Yeah. You like it? Yeah. Uh, special for you guys today. So I'm actually not presenting today, so that's, that's good for you guys. I have really smart people in here. <laughs> <laughs> We're arm wrestling later, man. I'm going to lose, but yes, sir. Uh, George Stefanik, uh, run a blog, my uh, in the healthcare space, also in uh, consulting in other spaces, uh, handles wires group. Uh, I'm Steve Foskett, S. Foskett, and I made this thing happen. <laughs> My name is Chris Little, my blog is uh, wifiqb.com and wifiqb on Twitter as well, and uh, I'm a work for a Rackers client. Excellent. My name is Scott Lowe, I'm other Scott Lowe on Twitter, and I'm a virtualization storage guy. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know we don't do that, right? <laughs> he, he's, he's at the wrong event. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually want you, I want you, Stephen, Stephen doesn't know your name, so. Perfect. Yes, sir. Blake Crony, um, podcaster and blogger, nsashow.com, and I work for a, a wireless services company and will install any, any brand as long as we know how to do it. So looking forward to learning it more. Great. And Twitter's Blake Crony. I'm Rocky Gregory. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say that right? Yeah. Uh, been doing wireless for some time. I work for a partner company as well. Um, and I am at Bionic Rocky on the Twitters. Uh, I'm Scott Stapleton, um, blog at uh, phasedcoexistence.blogspot.com, and on Twitter at Scott P. Stapleton, and I'm just down the road in Australia. <laughs> I'm coming that direction. Well, yeah, east, west, west. <laughs> if you go east, you'll get there eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, good to have everyone, yeah. I'm uh, Ryan Adzma, or Adzma uh, on Twitter. Um, I'm uh, operations manager. So I'm a generalist. I do it all. Um, huh? I've done a lot of wireless in the past, but not as much as these guys. I just kind of get into everything. Excellent. I'm going to go. Greg Chai, try to provide that. Can you say that one more time? Greg or Chai. Who, Chinik? And I'm not Chinese. Who, <laughs> Chinik? <laughs> yeah. We, we spent 20 minutes on Von Nagy last time, so. <laughs> yes. Gregor. Yes. Yeah, independent contractor, and I do Wi-Fi. So I'm a specialist, not a generalist. And, and you kind of beat us up a little bit once in a while. But we need that. Well. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you beat up people equally, so we appreciate that. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So the way today is going to go, instead of uh, a standard, you see there's no projector or anything. So what we're going to do a little bit differently is we have uh, Mr. Steve Martin here, and he's going to be our first uh, presenter. But what we're going to do is we're going to make this all Q&A. And some of it will come from Marcus and I. So Marcus and I have some kind of pre-done questions to get and make sure it's going the direction we're, we want it to go. Um, but this is a Q&A session. Now, we're going to have to cut everybody short, unfortunately, with every session. But feel free to ask questions. Um, but, so you're not going to see any official presentation uh, from us. Um, so does that sound about right, Marcus, where we get going? So we're going to start with uh, Mr. Steve Martin, if you don't mind coming up. You're mic'd up and everything, and um, I'll probably talk loud enough that this is needed. Well, we're okay. going—we're live feed, man. We're okay. we're going to 1.2 million people oh. right now. <laughs> it's better than the Super Bowl. Yeah, or exactly. The iPhone 5 <laughs> introduction, you know. Um, so, uh, any rate, I'm head of engineering here at Ruckus. I've been here for now six and a half years. Um, time flies, and. Uh, before this, I ran engineering for airspace, which some of you may remember got acquired by Cisco. So I spent a year in the Cisco's wireless group back in ancient times, 2005, 2006, so quite a while ago. Um, though it's been useful in terms of uh, helping to convince some Cisco people to come join us now uh, as part of engineering. Um, give you a brief overview of Ruckus Engineering. Uh, we have a little over 300 engineers worldwide, five development centers uh, here, Taiwan, China, Bangalore and Israel, so we are a very global engineering organization, virtually impossible to get everyone on a conference call at the same time anymore, um, but a uh, very talented team spread around the world uh, with respect to engineering. 
Um, specifically, I think one of the things that uh, GT and Marcus and I talked about that I think you know wanted to give you some sense of is you know obviously Ruckus really pride we really pride ourselves on on RF performance, uh, access point radio development, et cetera. Uh, we continue to move to broaden our product portfolio and our capabilities in terms of control and management platforms and distributed systems and things of that sort. And there's a huge amount of emphasis there. Um, literally hundreds of software engineers now working on, on kind of upper layer functions, if you will. But our core has always been, is really been on the wireless side and we continue to drive forward in terms of being, you know, the best RF company in the business uh, to the uh, extent that we possibly can. Um, so just to give you some sense of what does that mean, you know, it's nice words and, you know, good bullets, but if you think about, take it from an engineering perspective, it literally starts from how we start a design all the way through all the design phases to the point that we actually go into production and through production in terms of how we constantly pay attention and, and make special emphasis to make sure that we have the best RF designs, the best products we can uh, on the radio side. Uh, possible. So, for instance, you know, Stephen, I'm going to interrupt you real sure. quick. Can we start by Marcus and I realized yeah. actually realized this yesterday. The term reference design mm -hmm. can mean a lot of different things. What what at basic is reference design for what we how we say it? So most vendors or all vendors, I guess I should say, actually start the chip makers make reference design. So in order to build products, if you're Qualcomm, Atheros, if you're Marvell, if you're Broadcom, whoever you basically make a reference design. In other words, chip maker <coughs> makes a chip, then they actually make a, an access point design, for instance, um, or they make a variety of access points designs that then are representative of how they believe you should make an access point. And that includes both software, board level, hardware. It's, it's a complete design. And if you're a Taiwanese um, manufacturer, you pretty much just take that reference design, you put it in a box, you maybe change the splash screen on the GUI and, and you ship it. It's, it's a done product if you're, for instance, a Taiwanese ODM. If you're an enterprise wireless LAN manufacturer, you know, perhaps you do a bit more with that. You take that reference design, maybe you do some, some level of enhancements. Um, but effectively, it's a prepackaged design, hardware, software, everything. You really just need to package it up and, and put it in a box and sell it. Uh, and so that's, that's the starting point in the industry for, for how you build products, at least at the radio level. Um, what Ruckus does is, in looking at it and having you know, a lot of experience and expertise in it, um, you know, we take the reference designs, basically, you know, if it was a car, we pull off the fenders, pull out the engine, pull the transmission out, redesign the thing, and put it back together again. Um, generally, the software has bugs in it that we don't like, so we've completely revamped all the software offerings. Uh, we don't use the, the reference design software. From a hardware perspective, we tend to use kind of the CPU or the core sections, memory CPU, as that's not as much of a differentiator sometimes in terms of overall performance, though we sometimes make tweaks there. But we completely redesigned the whole RF section, completely new board layouts, new amplifiers in terms of power amplifiers, LNAs, the associated circuitry for that, work on making our products the quietest in the business in terms of very, very quiet from a design perspective so that you have the best received sensitivity, et cetera. So, so reference designs are just that. They're, they're designs, but many companies use those as virtually as, uh, as products and just take them directly to production. We effectively completely redesign them. So everyone else does it, right? I mean, all the other enterprise wireless land vendors so, you know, there's, there's levels of, you know, you can just take a reference design and resell it, mm -hmm. or you can completely redo everything, basically what we do. Does everyone else do that as well, or is that unique to us, or is there... It's fairly unique. Like anything, there's, there's, you know, different people do different things. I would say that, in my experience, we do the most. I mean, certainly I'm familiar and have worked at some of the other competitive wireless LAN companies and, and certainly are familiar with all the different wireless LAN companies. If you look at, you know, Cisco, Aruba, Aerohive, Meraki, I don't know whichever ones I'm missing there, you know, right. the, the normal, you know, the normal checklist of people who are in this business, 
Um, without a doubt, we do the most. Um, next up if, would probably be Cisco. I mean, Cisco, uh, you know, obviously I've been there. We've got a lot of Cisco, ex-Cisco people here uh, have a high respect for them. Um, they uh, certainly uh, do quite a bit as well, probably not as much as we do, or at least not in my experience from when I was there. Um, and then, then you kind of get everybody else, which is Aruba, Aerohive, Meraki, which effectively do very little or get a Taiwanese ODM to actually do whatever changes for them. Um, one of the things that we discovered over time, and kind of by <laughs> school of hard knocks, if you will, is uh, like a lot of companies, you know, Taiwanese ODMs will design things for you. So if you want them to change something, you can go to uh, a manufacturer in Taiwan or China and say, hey, can you make these changes for me? Can you build this product for me? Uh, we've tried to do that. Everyone, a lot of other people, um, notably some of the vendors I just mentioned, do that as that's their main may of, way of getting designs done. Um, the reality is we've never been able to achieve the level of quality or the level of performance and satisfactory results with that method, even though we've tried because it's cheaper, frankly. Um, you know, they're, you know, ultimately it's, you know, trying to be efficient from an engineering cost perspective, but we haven't been able to get the level of quality or performance or consistency we wanted doing that. So can you, can you dig into that a little bit? What, what is, I mean, you know, you, quality is, you know, sort of hard to, hard mm -hmm. to draft. What, what was not quite good enough or what are some of those metrics right. that we measured? To right. Say this is better. Well, so a typical, just some, some very basic things is, um, overall, um, you know, channel to channel balance of the RF performance and noise floor characteristics, you know, so some of the technical aspects with respect to RF performance, again, for the moment, let's focusing on the hardware portion of it. There's a soft, there's a very heavy software component to this as well um, that makes a difference. But, you know, if you want to have the best receive sensitivity in the business so that you can you know, kind of better pick signals out of the soup and, and be able to pick up signals at farther distances um, or at a given <coughs> distance have a higher rate of receive. You know, what your noise floor performance is is critical and it's really, really hard. From a hardware perspective, that's, that's it's, it's hard stuff. And, it's, and so the difference between, for instance, a, a typical design that we would commission someone else in Taiwan to do or even one of the reference designs we'll typically have a three to six dB better noise floor than any of our competitors, certainly versus the reference designs and, um, and the ODM designs. And in this business, you know, when you're talking about dBs and RF and things like that, three to six dB is huge. Um, you know, at a, at a given distance, that could be double the throughput. Um, you know, so instead of 20 megabits at some given distance, that might be 40 megabits or, you know, pick your, pick your rate. So those are the kind of things that, uh, certainly, you know, are different that we can improve with our own design. I mean, to that extent, you know, we actually have a hardware design team internal, just easy metric here, you know, to give you an idea of kind of the commitment at Ruckus. Uh, we have a 25-person hardware design team. Um, beyond Cisco, I would challenge that any other uh, wireless LAN manufacturer that has anything even close to that in-house. So it's a huge commitment, and most of that is here in the U.S. I have 20 hardware engineers here, a uh, number of them PhDs. Um, it's a huge commitment, but we obviously feel that it's, it's worth it. I think, sorry, uh, go ahead, Keith. Oh, I was just going to ask, you mentioned that your 360 be different than others. Mm -hmm. How and where in the process would someone measure that if we wanted to do our own testing? Now, you have full labs, but right. as, as just Wi-Fi guys, how would we Beyond the throughput then. Yeah, that is really, uh, it's a good question. Um, measuring receive sensitivity is one of the hardest things to do in the business. Um, we, you know, we struggle with it and with a lot of guys who are, you know, I mean, th this is what they do for a living. Um, measuring receive sensitivity and measuring it accurately is one of the trickiest things to do um, and is very, very hard to do outside of a, a highly controlled lab environment. The thing you can measure is is basically uplink performance. And of course you have to measure that even under the right circumstances, um, you know, because things can get masked by different environmental aspects and, and whatever. But um, measuring transmit characteristics is, is not 
too hard if you have the right equipment. I mean, that, that's a fairly straightforward thing. Uh, thing. Things like EVM and transmit power and things like that are, um, EVM is error vector magnitude, I think, is basically the amount of distortion in your transmit signal. Um, those things are fairly easy, but, you know, measuring received sensitivity is, is tough. One of the things that, that people in this crowd will say is, hey, Ruckus is always late to market, mm -hmm. right? You know, our three stream came out a year after HP's three stream. What, why are we so slow? I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> yeah. why are uh, no, we slow? No, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I mean, part of the reason is, is we don't use the canned reference design. I mean, you know, so back to that. We don't just, you know, Qualcomm Atheros dumps out a new reference design with a new chip we don't just throw it in a box and send it out the door. We design new antennas. We um, do a, f a complete um, upgrade of the firmware and work through adapting any of the changes in the firmware to make sure that those are sound. We do an extensive amount of testing. Um, we have, really I think it's fairly unique to Ruckus, we have a dedicated wireless systems performance testing group. So I've got eight people that that's all they think about is testing wireless performance. And this isn't just a simple QA exercise. I mean, to give you an indication, out of those eight people, four are PhDs. Um, you know, this hard stuff, you know, you back to how do you measure performance. Measuring performance in wireless systems is really hard. So we characterize that. We look for issues and problems um, that perhaps other vendors don't, don't see or don't look at. Even the uh, manufacturers don't see. And, take, and then attempt to correct those. Take us through, when we talked about this, you were telling us, you know, we do all these things, then we do what's called a board spin, mm -hmm. right? So, and then we cycle through that multiple right. times. So if you could take us yeah. through that kind of quickly. So typically what happens is we'll take a reference design, we'll adapt it, we'll create our own version of that in terms of a new, a new board layout, um, and then ultimately you got, have to get that board fabricated, you have to get it assembled, then you bring it back in and you test it. And we'll test it and inevitably, we'll find, hey, we think we can get another 3 dB out of this. This isn't as quiet as we think it should. Oh, we're seeing these issues on these various performance quarter cases. For instance, you know, measuring things like what happens when on a dual band when you're transmitting full blast on one band and receiving on the other one. Do, do you see any interference or interaction between those bands? Um, you know, so things like that. What happens if you have a cellular repeater next to you, which is very, very common anymore and getting more common all the time in terms of a microcell, picocell, femtocell. What happens if you have one of those two feet away from your Wi-Fi access point? You see this all the time in any kind of public venue. Um, how much interference do we see from that and are there things? So we look at all these things and then we make improvements. We spin the design again. In other words, we relay out the board, try to make improvements, take it back, through the manufacturing process, bring it back again, test it again, did we fix that stuff or not? Did we close those gaps or not? And in a typical design, one of those board spins, manufacture, test it, verify it, and it, you know, what we call kind of this complete cycle, you know, it's, it's probably a two month, two month operation, including all the testing, et cetera. So in a typical design, we'll do that maybe three times um, you know, just to pick an average in terms of where we continue to make improvements. So we'll need to spin it, iterate it three times um, to, to really get to the point that we believe it's at the quality level that is, you know, that's capable of being delivered. So, you know, right there you're, you know, it's a six month, six month plus kind of process to, to take that kind of so time and care. Is, uh, chips mainly, uh, yeah, Qualcomm uh, Atheros, uh, yes. Um, so I know that, that Cisco, for example, uses mainly the Broadcom ones. Is there a huge difference between the different chip manufacturers in terms of selecting radio chips? Um, yes, there is. Uh, actually, I think, and, and, and again, I um, won't claim to have detailed knowledge because my knowledge is a little bit dated, but I think on the Cisco Winboo side, on the wireless networking business unit, the, the enterprise side, it's mostly Marvell. Um, if you go to the Linksys, portion of Cisco, the consumer portion I think it tends to be a little bit more Broadcom because Broadcom tends to focus in more of the high volume, more consumer oriented. Um, Cisco is typically, uh, or has been in the past at least, typically Marvell uh, and most of the other enterprise wireless LAN vendors that you're familiar with are Qualcomm with Theros. Um, yes, there is a difference. I mean, we continually talk to Broadcom, Marvell, Atheros and other vendors you know, tr constantly surveying kind of the state of chip manufacturing and what features they have and their performance, et cetera. 
Um, you know, consistently, you know, the Athero stuff is pretty good. Um, it not only is very high quality, I mean, they were the leaders. They developed the first five gigahertz chips that were ever on the market. So they just are very, very good from an RF perspective. They consistently have some of the best RF performance. Um, they also, for a company like Ruckus, who has um, a very uh, deeply involved uh, software development. We have a bunch of software developers who are experts in, in the wireless portion of, it, of the design. Um, we tend to get down to literally, again, a much lower level than most other software or wireless vendors in the sense that we're actually manipulating registers in the chip. And, and frankly, Atheros chips, Qualcomm Atheros chips, have more low-level control that we can access. Most people who are just prepackaging reference designs don't get to that level, but we have full source code access and always have had from Atheros, which is fairly unique in the industry. And we sometimes, quite often actually, tell Atheros what's wrong with their software as we make changes at the low-level software. But they, they have a lot of good knobs to turn, which if you're in this business, RF is very dynamic, so having software that can dynamically um, modify the performance of the system in response to what the environment is, is, is incredibly important. And so, you know, so that's a lot of what we do. I don't, I don't know if that answers your no, question, it, but... It's, it's a very good answer. Yeah. It's part of, for me, of working out the difference between why a certain manufacturer would go with a certain chipset. And I've noticed that apart from Cisco, most of the, the other manufacturers tend to use the Atos chipset and always wondered why that was. Yeah, and, and, a, and a big part of it for us, you know, I, I just I would guess I'd just summarize it's it's really a few things. Number one, they make really great chips. They have their chips have excellent RF performance and they have, you know, kind of a full set of features. They have a lot of because they're they're kind of geeky RF guys themselves, they have a bunch of low level knobs which we love. Um, and in terms of us continuing to improve the product. They also, um, we've had a very, very close relationship with them, frankly, probably closer than most of the other uh, wireless LAN vendors that even use them, so that we have full source code access. We regularly meet with their engineering teams as well as their CTO um, and discuss further things we'd like them to do to their chips. And, and that enables us to get very low level in terms of some of the changes and the modifications that we can make. Marcus, do you have another question, or is it tour time? Or um, I, one more thing, I guess I'd like to touch on is you know we do all this design stuff here, mm -hmm. or or you know in our you know other international groups, but we ultimately have to have it manufactured somewhere. Right. It isn't that sort of the weak point in the link that you're going to see you know variance in the quality of manufacture process. What do we do to make sure that our design is delivered well? Excellent question. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, you know, it is a very good point. Um, again, I kind of mentioned that we, we pay a lot of attention kind of from soup to nuts, from the beginning of the design, from the reference design through manufacturing. Manufacturing RF gear is really hard. Um, designing it's hard, but manufacturing it in some ways is even harder because we all use contract manufacturing. We use contract manufacturing in Malaysia and China primarily, uh, high volume, uh, manufacturing um, that's really good at building widgets, you know, um, in, a, in a fairly repeatable fashion. But RF gear is really tricky because you, you change the value of one little capacitor, or you, they do some part substitution because the factory finds that they can get a part for a half a cent instead of a cent, and all of a sudden your RF performance changes. Uh, it's, it's a real problem. So things that we do to help ensure that, you know, the stuff we design actually works that way in production. Uh, we build all of our own manufacturing test setup. So even though we contract out the physical manufacturing, the actual test portion, when it comes to the end and you test the product before it gets put in a box and shipped to an end user, we have our own manufacturing test team. We own all the manufacturing test setups. We control that, and engineering works with our manufacturing test team to design and control those test beds so that we can ensure, um, you know, we let, you know, we contract the manufacturing, but you know, the buck stops when the thing gets put in a box and we make sure that we have very, very repeatable quality um, on the manufacturing test floor as, as, uh, as these things are built. And then even on top of that, one other kind of further step that we do is periodically we actually have a sampling program where periodically we just go buy 10 or 20 um, of a given model 
out of manufacturing, out of finished goods, if you will. We just randomly select you know, 20 of a given model. We bring them back into engineering and we run them through the whole engineering verification test, the very detailed engineering verification test to see, you know, is the stuff that's going out the door, is it still working at the same level at which we released it and which we designed it? And if not, why not? And then obviously correcting action. So, um, you know, so there's a number of things that we do that are, are um, you know, very effective, but really necessary to ensure that, you know, the products that come out of the box actually work to the level that we expect them to.